everything to me, everything to me, everything to me. Hallelujah. Have your way, God. We bless you. We love you. We adore you. In Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah and amen. Clap your hands if you love the Lord. Hug two people with a sideways hug and say, I love you and there's nothing you can do about it. Come on, hug two people sideways and tell them, I love you. There's nothing you can do about it. New direction? I'm going to tell y'all something real quick. I'm going to tell you like the old folks used to say in church in regards to how y'all came to church today. They may not come when you want them. <laughs> but they, they made it just in time. Look at somebody tell them, I'm glad you woke up. Listen, I need y'all's help. I need y'all's help because either one or two things have happened. Y'all help me real quick. Either one or two things have happened. Either one, the rapture occurred, and we are the only ones left. No, that's not it. Or two, the time change got your cousins, and they still in the bed. Uh-huh. I, I need your help to reach your cousins so they won't miss the rapture. Would you do me a favor? Uh, get your phones out, your smartphones. Uh, stand with me uh, as we get ready to go to God's Word in just a second. But first, let's deal with these sleepy heads. Um, let's text some people. Let's uh, share on the, YouTube, on the YouTube channel and the Facebook live stream that's going on right now. Go to that Facebook live stream, New Direction Christian Church Facebook page, and share. Hey, wake up. Pastor's got a word for you. Uh, just, just share. Just share. Tag some people. Amen. But everybody stand up. And I want you to grab your Bibles, and I want you to repeat after me and say, this is my Bible. I am who it says that I am. I can do everything that God told me to do by the power of the Holy Spirit that sees me through. God's Word is a light unto my feet, a lamp unto my pathway. When God's word is open, my path is illuminated. When that word of God is shut, I can't see where to go. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Amen. Stand with me real quick. I uh, want to look at a scripture this morning uh, as we get ready to continue on in our shape. Y'all, can y'all believe Easter is just a couple of weeks away? Man, I tell you, this year is flying by already. Mark chapter 9, uh, verses 2 through 29. Before I read that scripture, I want to remind you, um, how many married couples in here? Raise your hand if you're married and you're trying to stay married. Amen. You should raise them higher than that. <laughs> On March 16th, everybody say March 16th, we're having March for marriage. Uh, March, what is it, babe, 26? It is uh, National Black Marriage day. Um, and we thought it was so important with all this going on in the city. I don't know if y'all saw us on Live at 9 this past week. You saw me? Bless you. You saw Rhonda? Didn't she do a good job? She made me look good. Uh, so we were talking about doing this march on marriage. Pastor Terrell Munger, his wife Tiffany Munger, came up with this idea of marching from Marta Park to Tom Lee Park as a way to strengthen the family unit in Memphis. I believe, with everything that I got, that if we can get the homes right, y'all not going to help me. How old are these kids jacking folk in Memphis? 15, as early as 12. If we can get the families and the homes back right, get the daddies back in the homes, help the mothers to be strengthened, I believe we can claim our children and reclaim our city. So we're going to be marching on March 16th. We got 88 couples that signed up so far. I want to see more than that. How many New Direction couples can I count on marching with us on March 16th? Raise your hand. Any? Amen. I appreciate y'all. Thank you so much. Uh, we want you to march with us. It's going to be amazing. We're going to have food, fun, fellowship. Uh, we're going to renew our vows right there on the river. And then June, everybody say June. Wanda and I are putting together a Love in the Bluff marriage conference here in Memphis. A lot of people say, Pastor, I can't go out of town. 
you know, when y'all go to Jamaica, well, we're bringing it close to. And so we're going to be at the Hyde Centric Hotel for three days, two nights. Uh, that includes a hotel and five workshops. And we're going to partner with Dr. Payne for his 901 Live R&B Showcase. So we're going to be inspired. We're going to love on each other. We're going to learn, and we're going to have fun. So if you want to go and be a part of that, just simply go to drstacyelspencer.com and register. Look at, look at somebody that's married and say, you need to go register and invest in your marriage. Amen. Single people, where y'all at? <laughs> Pastor Frank Keaton and I are going to be working on some stuff for y'all, so don't be looking at me. I'll, I'll, I hear you sucking your teeth. The whole time I was talking, you're like, what about us? I ain't forgot about you. We got some, we're going to have something for y'all real soon, so it's coming. But I just want to make that announcement. Y'all ready for the word? Somebody say, I need it. Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 29, the New Living Translation version reads this way. I, I'm giving you a lot of scripture because I need you to understand the context of what's going on in this story. So here we go. Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain to be alone. As the men watched, Jesus' Jesus's appearance was transformed. Somebody say transformed. And his clothes became dazzling white, far whiter than any earthly bleach could ever make them. Then Elijah, listen to this, then Elijah and Moses appeared and began talking with Jesus. Now, y'all, Moses and Elijah have been dead for 400 years. Elijah and Moses appeared and began talking with Jesus. And Peter exclaimed, Rabbi, it's wonderful for us to be here. Let us make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He said this because he didn't really know what else to say, for they were all terrified. Look at somebody tell them, sometimes it's good just to be quiet. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my dearly loved son. Listen to him. And suddenly, when they looked around, Moses and Elijah were gone, and they saw only Jesus with them. Look at somebody say, what does God, who does God have to take away for you to finally see Jesus? As they went back down the mountain, he told them not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept it to themselves, but they often asked each other, what does he mean by rising from the dead? Then they asked him, why do the teachers of religious law insist that Elijah must return before the Messiah come? Jesus responded, Elijah is indeed coming first to get everything ready. Yet why do the scriptures say that the Son of Man must suffer greatly and be treated with utter contempt? But I tell you, Elijah has already come, and they chose to abuse him just as the scriptures predicted. And when they returned to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd surrounding them, and some teachers of religious law were arguing with them. And when the crowd saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with awe, and they ran to greet him. What is all this arguing about? Look, look at somebody and ask him, why, why all this arguing in the church? And one of the men in the crowd spoke up and said, Teacher, I brought you my son so you could heal him. He is possessed by an evil spirit that won't let him talk. And whenever this spirit seizes him, he throws him violently to the ground. Then he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I ask your disciples to cast out the evil spirit, but they couldn't do it. Jesus said to them, You faithless people, how long? must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought the boy, but when the evil spirit saw Jesus, it threw the child into another violent convulsion. And he fell to the ground, writhing and foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked, how long has he been like this? And his daddy said, since he was a boy. And the spirit often throws him into the fire or into the water trying to kill him. How many of y'all have ever seen the enemy try to kill your kids? 
trying to kill him. And, and Jesus, have mercy on him. Help us if you can. What do you mean? If I can't, I need somebody to get happy right here. Jesus said, what you mean? If I can. Look at somebody and say, you don't believe no more? What do you, what do you mean? If I can. Anything, listen y'all, anything is possible if a person believes. I need you to get this in your spirit. Look at your neighbor and tell them anything is possible if you only believe. The father instantly cried out, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. Is there anybody in here like that this morning? And when Jesus saw that the crowd of onlookers was growing, he rebuked the evil spirit. Listen, you spirit that makes this boy unable to hear and speak. He said, I command you. Oh, my God, I, I need y'all to get to this one. I command you to come out of this child and never enter him again. Look at somebody and tell them this is the last day you're going to deal with this. Then the spirit screamed and threw the boy into another violent convulsion and left him. And the boy appeared to be dead. A murmur ran through the crowd, and people said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand. Oh, man, I, I so much in this text. He took him by the hand, and he helped him to his feet, and he stood up. I'm, I just want to people in here, people have written you off from dead. People have written you off for dead and said you weren't going to make it, and they looked at your career, they looked at your marriage, they looked at you, and they said, they're dead. I need you to raise your hand if you've ever been left for dead. Uh-huh. But afterwards, when Jesus was alone in the house with his disciples, and he raised the boy to his feet, and the boy came back to life. And Jesus, afterwards, when he was in the house with the disciples, they asked him a question. Why couldn't we cast out that evil spirit? And Jesus replied, this kind. Y'all ain't going to help me today. Somebody say, this kind can only be cast out by prayer and fasting. What I want to talk to y'all about this morning is what goes up must come down. Look at your neighbor on the way to your seat. Say, what goes up must come down. Y'all may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Y'all, worship has been crazy the last couple of Sundays. Can y'all agree with me? There's something different going on. Tommy, thank you for, uh, for ushering us into the presence of God. Give God praise for Tommy and Tyranny and the Live and Direct Choir. They have been off the chisel for rizzle. I, I know y'all don't say that no more. What do y'all say? Lit, fire, lit, not fire. I give up. Um, it's been good. It's been so good. I, I had a, a friend of mine tell me the other day, Pastor, you're getting up too early. Let, let, let the choir just, just that praise and worship is about to break loose. We need that. I, I agree. I want to bottle it up and take it with me. I, sometimes I don't even want to get up and preach because the, 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 the worship is so powerful. But But the worship... And the praise and the worship is great. But there's also something waiting on us when we come down. C can somebody help me? Have you ever been in church, Rodney, and had a wonderful experience, and then you go to work on Monday like, what the hell? Oh. You, you, you don't even make it to Monday. You get home Sunday and like, what is this? What is all this chaos? God prepares us on the mountain for what we're going to have to handle in the valley. What goes up must come down. You can't stay up forever. I would love to stay in here with y'all all week. I would love to feel this, this feeling all week long. I would love to stay up. But the reality is, is that responsibilities and chaos and sometimes confusion are waiting on us in the valley. But the good news I want to give you ahead of my text before I work the text is that even when I go up with Jesus, if I go up with Jesus, that, that the good news is, is that I'm also going to come down with Jesus. Y'all miss what I just said. I'm talking to somebody that's got a difficult week in front of you. You got some challenges waiting on you. You got some drama at the house. You got some stuff unfolding at work. And whatever you do today, I need you to glean everything you can because you're going to need this when you come down. The Bible says, when Matthew, Matthew says in his gospel, six days later, y'all see that? In, in verse 2. 
it says six days later. Somebody asked me, what happened six days before? Uh, y'all, y'all not going to talk to me? I said, ask me, what happened six days before? I'm glad you asked. Uh, what had happened was Jesus had asked his disciples, who do they say that I am? And they said, some say Elijah, some say Moses, some say Paul. He said, but who do you say that I am? And Peter said, ooh, ooh, you are the Messiah, the chosen one, the anointed one, the one that came to save us. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Peter, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. On your professing faith, I will build my church, and it ain't going to be whack. I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And then Jesus went on to tell them that he would suffer and die and be raised again. And Peter pulls Jesus to the side. He says, watch this. He says, that ain't going to happen. I'm not going to let it happen. And Jesus looks at Peter and says, get behind me, Satan, for you want the things of men. Here's another version. He tells Peter, get behind me, Satan, because what you're saying is a trap to me. Some of y'all got some well-intentioned family and friends who want to talk you out of your purpose because it includes suffering. Where we get messed up is to think that life is only consists of mountaintop experiences. Sometimes in order for me to get to my purpose, I must descend from the mountain and go through the valley. But everybody can't walk with you from the mountain to the valley. There's going to be some people who have cognitive dissonance and don't understand the shift in your life. Why is it necessary that I have to go through a valley when God already has me on a mountain? Because the mountain is for my elevation, but my but 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 the valley is for the manifestation of my purpose. I cannot get to where God's trying to take me without going through the valley. Am I talking to anybody in here who's going through a valley moment right now? God, help me preach this. Uh, Peter, like the other disciples, had witnessed these miraculous things that Jesus had done, and they understood him to be the Messiah. They saw his star rising. They thought he was going to be a king like David and rule over all Israel and get rid of the Roman occupation and get rid of all of this crazy racism, this systemic racism, and get rid of all this misogyny and and oppression. And and they thought he was going to come and, and just restore Israel to its glory. But little did they know that he would have to die on the cross. Jesus turned to Peter and said, get away from me, Satan. You're a dangerous trap. You're seeing things. Watch this, y'all. You're seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God. It's dangerous when you link up with people who only see it from a human point of view. You've got to be in relationship with people who see it God's way and not just their way. Because if not, that becomes your trap. This is one of Jesus' closest disciples, yet he couldn't see Jesus even after three years of walking with him because of his vantage point. Y'all got to help me. So we fast forward six days later, and Jesus has to take Peter higher to show him a different vantage point. The mountain that God wants to take you to is because your perspective has been limited. You've been around so many things and people that you haven't been able to see God clearly lately. Am I talking to anybody? You, you've been so inundated with business and chaos that God every now and then has to steal you away and take you up higher so he can give you a clearer perspective. You know what I love about flying? Oh, help me, God. Sometimes I love flying because it helps me to give above the clouds. I get above, sometimes I leave Memphis and it's all gray and dreary. It's like a cloud hanging over the city. And every now and then when Ron and I go on vacation or go on retreat and we get up on that plane, we get above the clouds, all of a sudden what happens is crazy, y'all. It's all dark underneath the clouds. But when I when, when you reach the elevation for which the flight is needed, you get about 30,000 feet in the air and you begin to see what people can't see down there. And that is the sun is shining, the clouds just been blocking it. 
some of y'all are in a place right now in your life where you can't see clearly. It seems like there's clouds hanging over you. And God says, the reason you came to church this morning is because I needed to increase your altitude. Ooh, y'all hard this morning. Y'all sitting on your hands and everything. Watch this. It's my prayer that this 40-day shape journey has allowed you to climb higher in your perspective as disciples of Christ. My prayer is that God will reveal to you that self-preservation is not the way of Christ. To be a disciple of Christ, watch this, means that you take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow him. To follow Jesus really means to die. It's a call to die. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but don't nobody want to die. I'm not talking about just physical death. I'm talking about a death to the stuff that was holding you back. You're going, the reason we're not eating meat, Melvin, the reason we're not eating meat is because we're denying ourselves, pulling away from the table, because at the end of the text, he says, feast time only. I, I'm working ahead of myself. Let me, let me just say where I am. We can't just follow Jesus when things are going great. We're on our way up, but you have to be able to follow Jesus even in the valley. For 33 years, Jesus had been on an upward ride, but he is nearing the end of his journey, and he has to stop on this mountain to teach the disciples that what goes up must come down. Y'all ready for number one? Number one, Jesus takes you higher to give you a greater revelation of who he is. Jesus takes his inner circle up on top of Mount Tabor, and whenever God wants to reveal something to his people, he always takes them up a mountain. When God gave Moses, y'all going to talk to me today? When God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, where did he take him? He took him up on Mount Sinai, where he stayed with the Lord until he got the commandments of God. Whenever Jesus taught or did anything, he used a mountain. In the Gospels, mountains figure prominently in Jesus' ministry. On the mountain in Mark 646, after he dismissed everybody, he went up on the mountain to pray by himself. In, in Mark, Matthew 5 and 1, he preaches. A lot of crowded people came around him, and he went up on a mountain and sat down and started teaching from the mountain. He performed miracles. There were people in Matthew 15, 29 that were sick and laying on mats, and they brought them to Jesus, and he healed them sitting on the mountain. In John 6, 3, he's tempted. He's tempted. The devil takes him to the highest point of the mountain. Y'all not going to help me preach. The devil took him to the highest point of the mountain, and he says, the Bible says, if you throw yourself down, that he will keep you from falling but it also Jesus says but the word also says that you should not tempt the Lord your God are y'all listening to me watch this some of y'all the greatest temptation you had is when God made you successful your, your greatest temptation didn't come in the valley it didn't come when you was broke it didn't come when you was in the club it didn't come it came after you got yourself together y'all not gonna hear me is there anybody in here that got to the top only to make some bad mistakes because the greatest temptation doesn't come when you on your way up the greatest temptation comes when you get to the top I heard a preacher once say he said if you're gonna make a mistake make it before you get to the top because the higher up you go, Patrick, the more people you're going to bring down with you if you fall. Money only amplifies who you really are. So if you are a sinner on your way up, you're just a bigger sinner when you get to the top. Because now, watch this, you got money to sponsor your vices. Oh, Dennis, nobody wants to hear this. It's, I know y'all still sleepy. I understand. I, I, y'all go on and rest today. Rest. We'll, we'll, we'll shout next Sunday. But what I want to tell somebody is y'all are in danger of your hardest fall the closer you get to the top. Mm, 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 mm. Like mountains elsewhere in Scripture, the Mount of Transfiguration is a place where God and humanity encounter each other. Indeed, where God reveals himself to humanity. Has God used any mountains in y'all's lives to teach you something? Huh? Kurt Carr said it best. For every mountain, huh? You brought me over. For every trial, you've seen me through. For every blessing, hallelujah. For this, I give you 
praying. Okay, I'm going to throw you an alley-oop real quick. I just want everybody who's ever had a mountain and God saw you through, I want you to shout on that real quick. Is there anybody who's ever had a mountain in your life that you didn't think you were going to get over? A mountain of cancer, a mountain of debt, a mountain of legal issues, a mountain of relationship issues. Have you ever had a mountain that God saw you through? Touch somebody and tell them you ain't the only one. Watch this. Number two, when you go higher with Jesus, you will experience transformation. I'm going to say that one more time for the people in the back. When you go higher with Jesus, you're going to experience transformation. When they got to the top of the mountain, Jesus' appearance metamorphosizes. He starts glowing. <laughs> the reason is that Jesus is trying to to show his inner circle that they really don't know who he fully is yet. Could it be that even when you walk with Jesus for three years, that you really don't have a full revelation of who Jesus is? For some of y'all, Jesus is just a lawyer. You only call him when you're in trouble. For others, he's only a grocer. You only call him when you're hungry. For others, he's just a counselor. You only call him when you're having issues. But for me, he's my everything. Is there anybody in here that God has to allow you to go through something before he shows you that he's everything? Is there anybody in here who's ever been down and needed him to lift you up and you determine and you experience that God is more than what I've made him to be? We don't fully, we will never fully know who God is until we get to heaven. You will never fully understand. And even when you get to heaven, you're going to be like, that's Jesus? Y'all seen the movie The Shack? It's such a powerful movie, right? Because God, God shows up to the man who loses his daughter through murder. He shows up in a way so that he's not intimidated by who he is. So he shows up first as a black woman because he was raised by an abusive white father. So God, uh, so God shows up in a way that's non-threatening because he had a nanny who was a black woman who nurtured and loved him. So God wanted to show up as nurture and love. Later, he shows up as a Native American. Y'all not going to help me. It's going to be some shock white folk that get to heaven. It's going to be some shock black people that get to heaven because God says, you made me this, but I'm really that. Oh, y'all don't want your pastor to teach you that. Y'all done got uncomfortable. We have made him a patriot. We have wrapped him around an American flag. We made him blonde hair and blue eyed. And Jesus is going to be up there with some dreads. I'm like, no, man, that's not me. <laughs> the reason that Jesus takes you higher is that he's trying to show you who he really is. I have a suspicion that some of us haven't fully experienced all of who Jesus is yet. There's so much parallel between Jesus and Moses. When Moses, watch this. What? Can, I'm, I'm, okay, y'all acting funny, so I'm going to make you talk to me. What do Moses, Elijah, and Jesus have in common? Because y'all y'all sitting on me, so I'm just going to stop right here. What do they have in common? Huh? Experience with God. What y'all say? What did they have in common? They all talked to God. What did, they, what did Moses, Elijah, and Jesus have in common? So I, I'm glad. Baby, you said mountaintop experiences. You're so smart and pretty. And I love you. But I want you to stop talking because you read my notes every week. <laughs> You're cheating. Everybody said they had 40 days in common. Moses was on top of the mountain 
for 40 days, 40 nights. Elijah was one of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament. When, Je- when he defeated the 450 prophets of Baal and he ran away after Jezebel said, I'm going to kill him this time tomorrow. You can have great exploits for God, be very successful in life, but one person can say something and make you want to kill yourself. Elijah told God, I'm tired, take my life. Moses wanted to die too. Did y'all know that? Moses, when them people was complaining, Elder Larry, all them people that he was 600,000, they was murmuring, complaining, we want to go back to Egypt. We had leeks and onions. Why we got, this ain't like the old church. I want to go back. And Moses said, God killed me. I didn't want to ask for these 600,000 people you gave me to leave, and they talking about they want leeks and onions. I, I, I can't remember. There's no grocery store in the wilderness. Just go on and kill. If you go, if God, he said this. He said, if you're going to treat me like this, just kill me right now. But Elijah, listen, 40 days, Elijah, God said, get yourself up, eat. Your journey is not done. Get up and go meet me on the mountain. And it took Elijah 40 days. And 40 nights, Rodney, can you imagine, what, how, how far would y'all go if you had to travel on foot for 40 days and 40 nights? Off of one meal. <laughs> y'all said not far. <laughs> you would if you knew it was a, a restaurant if, at the end of it. <laughs> Elijah travels 40 days and 40 nights, and God meets him at the mountain, and there's an earthquake, but God ain't in the earthquake. There's a fire, but God's not in the fire. There's wind, earth, wind, and fire. That, but he's not in that. And then there's a still, small voice. And God says to Elijah, you ain't the only one left. I got 7,000 that have not bowed their knee to Baal. They go on back and pick your successor. What do they have in common? 40 days. Tell me Jesus' 40 days, and I'll, and I'll leave you alone. What was Jesus' 40 days of doing? I'm going to make y'all think today. I'm, th- I'm through spoon feeding y'all, doggone it. Y'all, done been, y'all been in church all your life. You can't tell me what Jesus did for, for 40 days. He fasted for 40 days like you're supposed to be doing and not eating oxtail. <laughs> he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and when he got to the top of the mountain, it says that the devil says, throw yourself down because God said in his word, he'll catch your foot before it hits a stone. But Jesus also knew the word, and he says, but it also says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. So Jesus takes them higher on the mountain because he, he, there is where God shows up. And he, because he obedient and takes his disciples up higher, the Bible says God reveals Jesus to who the disciples is. His clothes begin to glow. Y'all ain't going to help me. The higher up you go, the more you begin to glow. Watch this. Talk to me, Moses. When Moses stayed on the mountain with God for four days and 40 nights, the power and the presence of God caused him to be such illuminated that he came down. His face was glowing. Somebody say glowing. His face was glowing, and the people begged Moses, God, we can't handle it. Put a veil over your face. And some of y'all, watch this, people, the people you hang with are so intimidated by your anointing that they don't want to see you glow. Look at, look at your neighbor and say, go glow. Somebody say, yeah, glow. I, yeah, yeah, I'm going to glow. I, I'm not going to dim my light just because you're intimidated by my greatness. I'm not going to dim my light just because you're intimidated by where I've been. I've been in the presence of God. I'm not going to tone it down. Why are you always talking about God because he's been too good? Why are you always praising the Lord because he's been that good? Is there anybody in here who's not going to allow anybody to make you dim your light? Look at your neighbor and say, yeah, glow. Yeah, do I do I, do I, do I, do I let my light shine in front of people that don't like me? Yeah, glow. Am I going to allow other people to stop me at work? Should I let my light shine at work? Somebody say, yeah, glow. Should I let my light shine even when people tolerate me but can't celebrate me? I need you to high five two people and say, yeah, glow. I need some folk in here who are not ashamed to allow your light to shine. Lift up both your hands and say, yeah, glow. All right. Y'all, y'all sit down. Oh, let me move on to number three. Y'all, y'all ready to go back to bed, ain't you? Watch this. 
Look at your neighbor and say, we can't stay up here. As good as it is on New Direction this morning, we can't stay up here. As much as I want to stay up here, I, I cannot stay up here because there's something in the valley that I got to deal with. Our tendency is to try to memorialize God's glory instead of taking our revelation to the valley. Peter, watch this. When Peter looks up and sees Moses and Elijah 400 years removed from the earth, sees them on top of the mountain. Can you imagine that? Y'all, okay, 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 okay. Y'all, y'all tripping right now. You tripping right now. If I took y'all on a retreat, just about a handful of us, and I took you up a mountain, and I started praying, and you looked up, and you saw Dr. King and Malcolm X standing there talking to me, what would you do? <laughs> if you looked up and Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth were standing there talking to me, and it was just me and you and a, and a couple more people, how would you respond? You have these phones out. Now, ain't no, ain't no signal up on the mountain. What you going to do? You're going to be like, oh, my God, that's Malcolm X. That's Dr. King. That's Harry Tubb. That's Sojourner Truth. That's Pastor Spirit. Oh, my God. And Peter said, Jesus. Jesus. Y yes, Peter. <laughs> How about we build a memorial, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah? And the Bible says he said this because he was scared and didn't know what to say. Your fear will have you say something stupid. Fear will help you to make a, a temporary place a permanent place. I understand what Ty Privet was trying to say about the church has become whack. But he said it in front of an audience that really couldn't contextualize what he was trying to say about whether the church has devolved. Jesus never meant, watch this, for us to memorialize the church. The church is not a building. The church is a gathering of people, which means that the church cannot lock in God's power. If I memorialize it and put up shelters, then that means that the only place I can experience him is up here. So if, I, if the church becomes the people, then the church is at, what's the name of your building you work in? The Shelby County government is now God's worship space. Do I have any teachers in here? Do I have any teachers? I need the teachers to stand up. When you let your light shine at school, your school building becomes God's worship place. Sit down. For those who work in corporate, stand up. When you go back to corporate America and you let your light shine, that becomes God's worship place. Y'all sit down. Everybody that got a house, stand up. When you go back home and let all the people that are still in their drawers right now who did not come to church with you, and you come back with a light and, and some sound and some songs in your heart, your house becomes your worship place because the church is not a building. The church is people. Y'all sit down. I, I, I wish I was, I wish I was resonating with y'all. Uh, watch this. Dr. King, when he came to Memphis to die, uh, the last sermon he gave, Dr. King said this. He said, when I got into Memphis and some, and some began to say the threats or talk about the threats that they were going to do against me, what would happen to me from some of my sick white brothers, uh, he said, well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop, and I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will, and he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. Y'all ain't going to talk to me. He's allowed me to go up to the mountain, and I've looked over, and I've seen the promised land, and we as a, I may not get there with you, but we as a people, we will get to the promised land. Is there anybody that's determined that Memphis is going to get to the promised land? That we as a people are going to get to the promised land? That we will one day see an end to 
systemic racism and bipartisanism. Is there anybody in here who's determined that we're going to get to the top? High five your neighbor and say we're going to get to the top. Listen, number four, you are going to need what you saw up there to handle what's going on down there. Let me put this up and hasten to my close. I said you're going to need what you got up there to deal with what's going on down there. The Bible says that when they got to the bottom of the hill uh, and they were walking down, Jesus said don't tell nobody till I, I, I'm, I'm raised from the dead. And even after walking with Jesus for three years, they still did not comprehend what he meant about rising from the dead. But while they're scratching their head about him rising from the dead, they get to the bottom of the mountain and there's chaos at the bottom of the mountain. And at the bottom of the mountain, he finds his other disciples that he left at the bottom arguing with religious people. Imagine that. Have y'all ever had to have an argument with religious people about your methodology, about why you do what you do at your church? How come y'all don't dress like this? How come y'all don't sing like that? And how come your pastor don't wear a robe? And how come y'all sing these type of songs? And why y'all got all them young people over there? And how come y'all don't have a dress code? And how come y'all don't dress up on Sunday? Do you ever get tired of arguing with religious people? Don't you know that the black Hebrews are right? Or the Methodists are right? Or the Baptists are right? Or the Presbyterians are right? Or the Catholics are right? I'm tired of arguing with religious people, especially, watch this, when our kids are out of control. I can find better things to do than argue with religious people about my methodology. There is a boy who has an evil spirit, and y'all can't do nothing about it. He, Jesus said, what's going on? He said, I brought my son to your disciples, and they couldn't do anything. You know what's sad? I, I'm going to be done in just a second. You know what's sad is that we want young people to come back to church, but when they get here, y'all too busy arguing. They want to be healed. They want to be helped. But we got people arguing about how it used to be. We got people arguing about their preferences. We got people arguing about what songs we going to sing. We got people arguing about where they going to sit. We got people arguing about who going to get the microphone. And there is a child that is possessed by a spirit that's contemplating suicide. And you too busy arguing that you can't even see how to help. Jesus said, what's wrong? He said, I brought them to your disciples, but they couldn't do nothing. And Jesus says, bring the boy to me, you faceless generation. And the reason Memphis is in chaos right now is because we got a lot of churches, but we don't have a lot of faith. We've been playing church too much. That's what's whack. We've been playing too much church. We've been religious. We know how to dress up. We know how to wear gaiters and hats and shout and jump. But we ain't dealing. We ain't helping nobody. He says, bring the board to me, you faithless generation. Uh, watch this. He says, he says, he says, how long has he been like this? As soon, watch this. As soon as the, the, the boy came to Jesus, the spirit in the boy, y'all ain't going to help. The spirit in the boy recognized who Jesus was and threw him into another convulsion. Watch this. Some of y'all are wondering why all hell broke loose the closer you got to him. Because the closer you get to Christ, that spirit recognizes the authenticity of who Jesus is. And he's going to try his best to keep your child from being delivered. As a matter of fact, some of y'all going to go home today with the anointing still on you. And somebody going to try to start a fight with you before you can get in the house good. It's not them. It's the spirit. Some of y'all going to be on your way home and somebody going to cut in front of you, going to make you want to cuss. That's not you. That's the spirit. You got to, you got to battle against that spirit and recognize it for what it is. Watch this. These kids that are jacking folk in Memphis, it's not them. It's a spirit. Do y'all still see the value in our children? Teachers, talk to me. <coughs> Do y'all see some of the kids you deal with and other people see them as behavioral, having behavioral problems? and ADD, HD and all these diagnoses, and you look and you see a child. 
was watching um I was watching a a, a show last night about this girl. It was oh, uh, who took this movie together? It was Bishop Drake's movie about this little girl who had been orphaned. Uh, she had been left abandoned by her mother and her father and was raised in the institution. And the only person that saw her was a, a white social worker. And the black social worker would not allow her to adopt this girl because she said black kids need black family. But the, own, the black woman couldn't even see who she was. And the little girl at 12, she says, you see me as a problem. Miss Claire sees me as her daughter. Some of y'all only see children as problems and overlook their potential because you can't just separate the spirit from the child. If you would have been through, help me preach today, God. If you would have been through an inkling of what some of these kids have gone through with mothers who are in and out of the house, y'all not going to have, with men coming in and out of the house and mothers not raising their kids, uh, the other day I was talking to Pastor Arnold in, in Knoxville, and he said that he said he had a teacher in his in his church when the when the storm when y'all remember that snow hit up, and they were out of school. This teacher took about five kids of hers home with her because they, the roads were so bad the parents couldn't get to them. And she and she said for three days none of their parents called to check on them. And y'all wonder why. These kids are doing what they're doing because you see them acting out, but you don't see what's got control of them. Okay, I'm going to go. I'll do better next Sunday. Uh, Jesus says, come out of him. Watch this. Before he says that, he says to the father, Lord, help me preach. How long has he been like this? And the thing that y'all have to ask as educators and people who work with troubled young people is not what's wrong with them, but what happened to them. This is shifting. This is shifting. It's going somewhere else. I want to preach and holler and all that, but I can't because I need to teach you today. Because a lot of what y'all are experiencing with these kids, something happened to them that you don't know. Somebody dropped them. Somebody molested them. Somebody that was supposed to be there never showed up. They've been raising themselves. The streets have raised them. And what it's going to take is somebody who has some anointing on them to recognize the spirit that's taking control of these children. And when Jesus begins to speak to the spirit, the spirit one more time throws the boy into a convulsion. And, 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 and the father says, help him if you can. And Jesus got an attitude. And he looked at the dad and said, excuse me, come and say that again. He says, help him if you can. He said, if you can. He says, don't you know that all things are possible for those who only believe? Can I help somebody? Jesus, when he first sees the problem, he says, it's a faithless generation. But then he goes on to say that all things are possible if you what? If you just believe. It's impossible, please God, what? Without faith. And many of y'all are stuck in a situation, not because God can't do it. It's because you don't have faith that he can. Can I help somebody today? Is there anybody up against anything that's going on in your life and you need God's help? I want to stop by and tell you, if you don't hear nothing else I say today, that whatever problem you're dealing with, God says, I can help you if you would only believe. I can help you out of debt if you only believe. I can help you out of that problem if you only believe. I can help you out of depression if you only believe. I can help you out of anxiety if you only believe. Is there anybody? I just need somebody with some issues to stand up and say, I believe. Help me with my unbelief. Can somebody tell the truth today that I've been in church all my life, but there are times when I get depressed and there are times when I get anxious and there are times when I'm wondering, is God going to come through like God said he's going to come through? And Jesus says, if you have faith, the size of a mustard seed. You can look at that mountain and say, be ye removed. And the mountain will pick itself up and throw itself into the sea. Is there anybody that can shake your neighbor's hand and say, you just need a little faith. You don't need a lot of faith. Ask God to strengthen the faith you got. I'm so glad that God can take a little faith and do a whole lot. My last point. Do you believe that Jesus can help our children? Look at somebody and say, I believe, I believe, I believe. 
Jesus says, do you believe? He says, I believe, but help me with my unbelief. And Jesus looks at that spirit. He says, come out of him and never come back again. And when he does it this time, the boy falls on the ground, and it looks like he's dead. I need some help right here. How many of y'all have ever had a season in your life where God truly answered your prayer, but it felt like you were dead? You, you, God changed you, but then he also changed the people around you. And the people around you perceived you to be dead. And God left you in a season where it looked like everybody walked away from you. Can I? I'm talking about five people. I ain't talking to the rest of y'all. It's just five of us in here that are in a lonely season right now, and it seems like everybody left you for dead. It's not that everybody left you for dead. God is just trying to make sure that fake people walk away. I need some help up in here. Is there anybody in here right now that feels like God has shifted something in your life, but it seems like I, I'm dead right now? I just need y'all to stand up so I can see you. Is there anybody besides me who feels like I'm dead right now because some people walked away from me, but the the good news is, is that this is my resting period. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm about to get back up. And when Jesus lifted the little boy up, he stood up on his feet and he started walking around. And the disciples said, how come we couldn't do that? And Jesus said, these kind only come out through fasting and prayer. I need somebody to help me preach real quick. Is there anybody in here who knows that when you go up and you got to come down, but if I go up with Jesus, good God Almighty, I'm so glad that Jesus Christ not only is Ascended, but the Bible says he also descended. He descended to the dead, and on the third day he rose again, which means that after he went up and when he came down, he came back up again, and he came back up distributing gifts. He made some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be teachers. Can I get somebody in here who's ever had an issue that God delivered you from to wave your hands and say, I'm on my way back up? Because if Jesus can get back up, I can get back up. If Jesus can go to hell and come back, I can come back. I need seven of y'all to meet me at the altar and say, I'm on my way back up. I'm on my way back up. I'm ready to glow again. I'm ready to grow again. Somebody, anybody, meet me at the altar and make a declaration to the enemy that I'm on my way back up. My family's on their way back up. My finances are on their way back up. My depression is leaving. I'm on my way back up. My cancer is remiss. I'm on my way back up. <laughs>